Okay, so how is everyone today? So I posted a whole bunch of announcements to, uh, to Blackboard. Uh, in particular, there's an online homework due Monday night. Two of them, in fact, but one of them is sort of trivial. Uh, there's a number of written homeworks due uh, at the beginning of lecture on Tuesday. Any question about any of that? <clears throat> any questions about any of those announcements? Okay, or so I posted the Tuesday's notes. I hope you were able to find them. I posted a PDF of them and a video. Any questions about any of that? Okay. <clears throat> so let's, uh, let's get to it. So last time when we left, we were talking about mm, the derivative. Specifically, we, we talked about the secant line uh, of a function. That is to say, you have a function and then you select any two different points on that function and the, the line going through, through those two points is called the secant line. Then, uh, using the machinery of calculus, if you hold one of those points fixed and then move the second point to the first point until they're on top of each other, you can watch the secant line move as you do this. And then, if there's a well-defined result, if the secant line actually goes somewhere and doesn't explode or something like that, then the resulting line is called the tangent line. And the derivative, uh, what the derivative is geometrically, it's the slope of that tangent line. That's what derivative is. Okay, then we ended with a discussion about what, what the geometry of the mm, product rule is. So let's finish that discussion. So specifically, uh, in, in a math class, usually when you're talking about the product of numbers, the right geometric interpretation is uh, a rectangle. So if you're considering the product AB, A product B, then the right interpretation, the right geometry for this is, the re is a rectangle with one of the sides A and the other side B. So specifically, <clears throat> the geometry of the product rule Generally, for product, A times B the product is the area of that rectangle. So, like the product 3, product 5, 3 times 5, well, that's the area of a rectangle that has one of the sides 3 and the other side 5 and that area is 15. Well, <clears throat> for derivatives, the product rule is the derivative of f of x product g of x is the derivative of f of x multiplied by g of x. So you differentiate the first one, multiply it by the second, plus the first one multiplied by the derivative of the second. And then your calculus one instructor may have probably just used the primes the <coughs> instead of d dx. <coughs> okay. So now, derivative, uh, fundamentally, in a sense, like when you're dealing with physical processes, derivative is measuring how something is changing. 
That's what it's measuring. So like if you're measuring something in time, its time der derivative measures how it's changing. In, in particular, uh, we'll go with the, 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 the values that a derivative can take, negative, zero, or positive. So if an object uh, is differentiated, if the derivative is negative there, then what's true about that object? if the derivative is negative. Hmm. What's true about the measurement if the derivative is negative? It must be decreasing. It must be decreasing. Okay, that's what, that's what a negative derivative means. So what if the derivative is zero? What must be true about the measurement that we're talking about? derivative is zero. No change. It's not changing. And what if the derivative is positive? It must be increasing. So it's an interesting fact that for physiologically normal human beings anyway, that if you were to plot the height of such human beings as a function of time, then there would be a pretty good stretch of between 14 and 20 years where the derivative is positive. Why will that be the case? Yeah, because you're growing, right? Then you, then you reach your maximum height. Right? And your height is, is practically constant for another 20 to 30 years. Okay? But there actually reaches a time when you're, when you're uh, when you get old and your, your back muscles and abdominal muscles are not quite as strong as they used to be and your bones are not quite as, as young as they used to be, they're getting a little worn out, you're, you actually start shrinking. Your height actually decreases. So, so it's an interesting fact in, human, in a typical uh, human life that ends by natural causes. Your height function first has a positive derivative then a zero derivative, and then a negative derivative. Because you first grow to your full height, then you are your full height for however long, and then as your body decays, your height decreases. Interesting. So what derivative measures is change. And therefore, what the product rule is saying, because product is related to areas of rectangles, and because derivative is related, it, it tells you about change, the, the product rule is necessarily telling you about how this rectangle is changing. It's making a statement about that. Let's see what statement is being made. So if we have a rectangle, And we say that that side measures f of x, and this side measures g of x. Then what I'd like for you to do is I'd like for you to imagine that I could, ch I could, I could grab hold of x on, the, on a number line and wiggle it around. And then you'd see this, this rectangle sort of quivering. Right? If, f, if f happens to be getting bigger, then you'd see it getting bigger this way. If g happens to be getting bigger, you'd see it getting bigger that way, etc. So this rectangle can move. So let's say that we increment x by an amount delta x. And let's say for the sake of argument, and just so I can draw something that's intelligible, let's say that f and g happen to both increase as a result of this. They both get bigger. So, it's, it, so this rectangle gets bigger <coughs> horizontally, and it also gets bigger vertically. So as a result, so this is what it looks like un, unchanged. And then it gets a little bit bigger horizontally, and it gets a little bit bigger vertically. <coughs> Now there are three regions that need to be considered. 
there's this red region. That's, that's the new stuff that is, that is solely the result of the horizontal measure changing. Then there's this piece, the green piece. That's the piece that is solely the result of the vertical measure changing. Okay, then there's also the corner piece. The corner piece is a result of, of both of them changing. Okay, now, we're going to assume that delta x is quite small, a very small quantity. I had to draw it big, otherwise it would be unintelligible. But we're going to assume that it's quite small. And then, as a result, that means that the best estimate for that change would be the derivative of f at x multiplied by delta x. That's the best approximation for that change. Similarly, what is the best approximation for the vertical change? g prime x times delta x. Okay, that's that's the the vertical change. Now let's let's calculate areas because areas is what's are, are, are what's changing so let's uh, dissect these so that part is just the same So all I'm doing is exploding out the pieces so they're a little easier to look at. So this red piece, we know that its base is f prime of x delta x. That's its base, the red piece. What's its height? g of x. So that means that the area is base times height, and the area of this is f prime of x g of x delta x because that's base times height base times height similarly <clears throat> for the green piece its area will be base times height <coughs> we know its height its height is g prime of x delta x what's its base f of x so its area is f of x g prime of x delta x. Notice that for the red and the green, for the red and the green, the green one has a, has a derivative with g but not with f, and the red one has a derivative with f but not with g. Now, what's the area of the corner piece? So we know its base and also its height. What is its base? Right. So its base is this. That's, that's the base of the blue, that one. And that is the height of the blue. So the product of these two is the area of the blue. So this will be f prime of x, g prime of x, delta x, and then squared because there's two of them. Okay, so any question about the accounting of the areas of the individual pieces? So... <clears throat> If we say that y is the product function f of x, g of x, then the change in y, since, since y is the area, the change in the area 
is the sum of the red and the green and the blue pieces. So let's add them up, the red plus the green plus the blue. So this is the red. plus the green plus, uh, I left out a delta x. Plus the blue. Now, in this equation, what do all the terms on the right have in common? Delta x is common to all of them, right? This one has a delta x, this one has a delta x, and this one has two of them, right? So that means that we could divide both sides by delta x, because this one has all of these terms on the right-hand side have a factor of delta x. So, supposing we divide both sides of this equation by delta x, what is the new left-hand side? Very good. So, delta y over delta x is, and then now, it'll still be the sum of three things, but what three things? So, notice that when you divide this one by delta x, then it doesn't have a delta x anymore. It's gone. So, you'll have f prime of x, g of x for that one, and no delta x's, what will you have for the next one? Mm -hmm. Plus f of x, g prime of x, and no delta x's. How about for the last one? Ah, but the last one does have a delta x, right? It does have one, because, because you only cancel one of, one of them away. So this would be f prime of x, g prime of x, delta x. Now, what I want you to recall is that from last time, delta y over delta x, well, that's the secant line, isn't it? That's the slope of the secant line. But we can turn slopes of secant lines into slopes of tangent lines. How? How do you turn secant lines into tangent lines? Mm -hmm. as, you, as you hold one point fixed and you let the other point go to the other one. So in calculus lingo, that would be, well, we'll compute the limit as delta x goes to zero, right? So now, compute the limit <coughs> as delta x goes to zero. Now, here's where the, here's where the joke, the punchline comes in, right? What is the, what happens to the left-hand side when you compute the limit? Yeah, it turns into Latin letters, right? So here is the Greek ones, delta, and then, okay, haha. The limit makes it turn into Latin letters, okay. dy dx. And now, note that this, this term right here doesn't have any delta x's. So it doesn't depend on delta x, so its limit is itself. Okay, so that one is itself. F prime of x, g of x. What about this, the next one? Also no delta x's, right? So its limit is itself plus f of x, g prime of x. And now, how about this one? What's the limit of this term as delta x goes to zero? Zero. It's zero, because that delta x is going to force it to zero. So then this is plus 
zero, and I'm writing it in blue because it corresponds to that blue term. So this corresponds to the red term, the red area. This one corresponds to the green area. And look, f prime g plus f g prime. That's the product rule. That's the product rule. What the product rule is saying is that you're looking at a rectangle changing. And only this piece, the red piece, and the green piece actually end up affecting the result. Because, as it happens, because delta x is so small, the corner piece is so small in comparison to the red and the green pieces that it doesn't affect the result. <coughs> That's what the product rule is saying. It's not, some, it's not some, some arbitrary formula that your calculus instructors demand that you memorize. It's talking about the way rectangles change. That's what it's saying. Good. Any question about this? OK. Now. <clears throat> When you have two functions, so let f and g be functions. Then you can construct new functions in the same way that you can construct new numbers using the same operations. So for example, one way you can combine two numbers to get a new number is with addition. Right? You can add two numbers to get another one. <coughs> so if we have two numbers, 3 and 5, then you can add them to get 8. Okay? Nothing, nothing incredible there. So what are some other, other operations you can use to combine two numbers to make another? Subtract. Okay, what else? Multiply. What else? Divide. And then there's exponentiate, right? But we'll stick to the, to the four. Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. You can do the same thing with functions. If you have two functions, you can add them together to get a new function. You can subtract them to get a new function. You can compute the product to get a new function and the quotient to get a new function. So given any two functions, you can do these things. f plus g, f minus g, f product g, f quotient g. You can do these things. The same four things that you can do with numbers. But what's the thing that you can do with functions that you can't do with numbers? So there's something you can do. OK, I like that. You can, you can in a sense, that's like saying you can plug things in. Right? Because to graph something, you've got to plug a bunch of values in so you can plot individual points. Okay? But there's an operation. Like, you can add two numbers, you can add two functions. You can subtract two numbers, you can subtract two functions. What's the operation that you can do with functions that you can't do with numbers? How about you can, d you can divide numbers and functions. What's the one? Start with C. And ends with compose. Compose. Yeah, he got it. Okay, good. You can compose functions. Right? Do you remember this? You can compose functions. So <clears throat> the way that you write that, the operation is this: f circ g and g circ f. So sometimes that's, set, that's called f composed with g and g composed with f. But it's very frequently called circ because that operation is a little circle. Okay? So you can compose functions. Now, <clears throat> my hope for you is that, uh, so I'll say it like this. Calculus is the study of functions. 
it's the study of what functions do and how they do them, and how, how they do their thing. Um, <clears throat> the mental model I want you to have for functions is that functions are like machines. They're like machines that accept inputs and produce outputs. So the definition of these in terms of a coordinate, f circ g, evaluate at x. Well, how do you write this? How do you write this without the circ operation? Right. You say you write it as f evaluated at g of x. Okay. And similarly, G circ F. How do you write this one without? Right. G of F of X. And the way, one way to remember it is that, which one is which, is that for this one, X always goes with wh whoever's closest to it first, right? So who's closest to X for this one? F is. So F gets the X and then g gets the f of x. Okay? So, functions are like machines that, that accept inputs and produce outputs. So, just as something to look at, so I'll call this the f machine. If you give it, if you give it an x, then it does its thing, and out comes an f of x. Right? That's what it does. The f machine takes an input x and produces an f of x. So if you gave it a 3, it would produce an f of 3, whatever that is. If you gave it a giraffe, f of giraffe. So similarly, g the g machine takes a g and what does it produce? Uh, sorry, takes an x and what does it produce? A g of x. Now, in history, there's a famous person, a famous American industrialist named Henry Ford. And, uh, of course, that's the namesake for Ford Automobiles, but that's not really what Henry Ford is, is remembered for. Rather, he's remembered for a certain very important and, and now pervasive innovation in, in industrialism. What, what is Henry Ford remembered for? The assembly line. Okay. The assembly line. Specifically, right, instead of, instead of like one craftsman saying, okay, I'm going to make this car from scratch, <coughs> just me, I'm going to do it. Rather than doing that, what happens is, is that raw materials come to a station and then you do something there, and you, 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 you make a small step toward the progress of creating a car. Okay, then that's it. That's all that happens at that step. Okay, in, raw material inputs come in, one step is performed, and then it's moved down the line. So the output of that step is then used as the input to the next step with possibly more raw inputs. So after a relatively short number of steps, a few hundred at most. You've got a Model T, right? Inputs, the input of one step produces output, which is used as the input to a next step. That's what composition is. So if we do this, if I say, well, I'm going to put the, I'm going to put the F machine here and then this and then right after it, I'm going to do the G machine, like so. Like this. Then, what goes right here? F of X goes right here, right? So that means that F of X is being used as the input for G. Now, what comes out right here? G of what? Of f of x. So, 
So, input, output is used as input, makes output. So now what I want you to consider is that, well, this is an assembly line process, maybe. Maybe it's really loud. So let's, let's give everyone earmuffs, and let's just go ahead and cover that up in a big box. So if we cover it up in a big box so that you can't see inside, all that you see is the inputs and the outputs. Well, what's the name of this box? This one is the F box. This one's the G box. What is the blue box? It is G circ F. Now, why is it G circ F and not F circ G? Right, right. Alternatively, you could ask, who gets the X first? F gets it first. F gets it first. So now when you're drawing these, you know, at least in the, in the style that I'm drawing it, you read them left to right, first F and then G. But when you're writing it in notation, it's, it, it's read right to left, first F, then G. So this one is G circ F. Okay. Now if we were to do it in the other order, then what goes here? G of X. And then what goes in the last slot? F of G of X. And then again, if we were to put a big box around this, then what is the proper name of this box? F circ G. Okay. So what composition is? It's this sort of, sort of if you like to, to physically analogize it, it is assembly lines. Use the output of one function as the input to the next. Henry Ford's great realization was that, well, if you can do it once, you can do it a hundred times. And you can make a Model T in a hundred steps. And then all that you really need is you just need to make sure that everyone is really good at their thing. Okay? Good. So now, if you take two numbers and you add them, does it matter what order you add them in? No. Right? 3 plus 5 is in fact the same as 5 plus 3. It makes no difference. How about, does it matter what, what order you multiply them in? No. Because 3 times 5 is the same as 5 plus 3. And the same is true of functions. Doesn't matter what order you add functions in. Doesn't matter you what order you multiply them in. But here's my question. Does it matter what order you compose them in? Is the result the same or is it different, potentially? It's potentially different. <coughs> that can matter. So let's, let's see why, it, using the assembly line analogy, that it, it surely could matter. Let's imagine that we all go into business. We say, you know what? We take a vote and say, you know what? I can see that dolls are a really hot market right now. Let's go into the doll manufacturing business. Okay, so then we have, we have the, the, the dolls. Uh, and let's say that we're at the part of the assembly line where the dolls are, are getting all of their accessories. Okay, they're getting all their accessories put on. So there's a station that puts on the on the left shoe, there's a station that puts on the right shoe, uh, there's a station that puts on the left sock, the right <coughs> sock, everything. 
the station for, for all of it. So now my question to you is, is does it matter what order the left shoe and the right shoe station are in? That is to say that would you be able to look at a doll on the shelf at, at retail and be able to tell, ah, the left shoe was put on first? No. So those don't matter. Th that, particular, that particular instance of left shoe versus right shoe doesn't matter. How about the pants station and the underwear station? Yeah, that matters, right? You can tell. One of them is a Ken doll, Barbie's <coughs> counterpart. The other one is Superman. Right? Totally different. The order of the stations matters in an assembly line. And the order of function composition matters in exactly the same way. Of course it has to matter. Because that's, the world would not be interesting if it didn't matter. Imagine what it would be like if the order of operations didn't matter. <laughs> that would, you could do something like you could do something <coughs> like say, you know what, I'm going to have people over for dinner, and I know it's going to run long, so I'm not going to have time to do the dishes. So I'm going to go ahead and do the dishes now. Right? I'll just I'll just go ahead and get that out of the way. <laughs> it would be a totally different universe. It's not the way it works, right? You, you can't clean the dishes until they're not clean. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So now, that's what composition is. And just like we looked at product and said, ah, product really is actually the, related to the area of a rectangle, and therefore the, the, the way the derivative interacts with products actually has to do with rectangles. What does the derivative do with compositions? Okay. What does the derivative do with compositions? So, the name for the way that derivative interacts with sum is called the sum rule. The way that derivative interacts with difference is called the difference rule. The way that derivative interacts with product is called the product rule. The way that deri derivative interacts with quotient is the quotient rule. What's the name for the way derivative interacts with composition? The chain rule. <laughs> Who came up with that? Right? The chain rule? It should be called the composition rule. If I could go back in time and change some things about mathematics as it, as it is today, that would be one of them. Okay, to say, nah folks, we're not going to call it the chain rule. We're going to call it the composition rule. <laughs> it's the composition rule. <clears throat> but we're going to call it the chain rule. So this is the geometry. of the chain rule. So specifically, the actual rule, rule is that the derivative of f of g of x, like so, so f composed with g, is what? So what's the rule? Can you remember? So this is, this is straight calculus one, prerequisite for this course. So if, if you're really having difficulty pulling this up from memory, then that is telling you something. <laughs> that you've got some considerations to make. <laughs> you've got to study, make it right. So it's the derivative of f evaluated at g of x, and then multiplied by the derivative of g evaluated at x. <clears throat> That's the chain rule. <clears throat> now, what I want to do is I want to convince you that this is totally natural. <clears throat> This is a natural thing. Is that, what if there was just one station? That is, just, that is to say, if it was just, we've just got the G station, and we're just plugging in X's and watching G of X's come out. Then if you changed X a little bit, 
If you change the input a little bit, then the output would change a little bit. And the way the output would change is measured by the derivative. How fast will it change? If I, if I wiggle x a little bit and the output changes a lot, that means the derivative is big. If I wiggle x a little bit and the output changes a little bit, that means the derivative is small. That's what, it, that's what that means. Now what happens if you put two of these machines in a row? Like this. Like this. <clears throat> so for this one, if it, was, if, it was just, if it was just x and you saw me wiggling this x, then you'd see that g of x wiggling. If it was wiggling a lot, that'd be a big derivative. If it was wiggling a little, it'd be a little derivative. Now what if we put two of these in a row? Then if I wiggle this x, that'll make this g of x wiggle. But then in turn, that'll make this one wiggle. They'll all be wiggling as a result. So let's see just how numerically, how does it all hang together? <clears throat> so specifically, we'll do this in stages. I'll say that this is the x's and this is the u's and this is the y's. <laughs> now, I'm going to single out a particular point here. I'll say that by abuse of notation I'll call this one x. So that's an x. Okay. So then now, to get from x's to u's, I'll, I'll say that we take the function g. So, oops. g is how we transform x's into u's. And let's say that this x, this x right here, happens to become this u right here. So G, G says, for this X, uh, you're going to become this U. Okay. Then the way you get from U's to Y's is with an F machine. So this is F. And then let's say that you come to, say, here. That U becomes that y. So this x to that u to that y. Now, <clears throat> if you were to sort of ignore this intermediate step, and you were just to go, well, I'm not really interested in all that stuff that's happening in the middle. I mean, after all, who's actually interested in who and just how the steering wheel was attached to your car? Not really many people, right? Who cares? If you do this, if you do this, then you're looking at F composed with G. So this is the view that, well, somehow that X becomes that Y. I'm not real sure what's happening inside, but that X becomes that Y. Okay, now, what I want you to imagine is that we slightly expand this x. So this x is a single point. Now I'm going to make it just slightly, have a, a slight extent, and I'm going to give it an orientation like this. So now it's, now it's a little arrow looking thing. So if we were to map all of these red points over here, so every single one of them, so not just x, but the next one, the next one, next one, next one, then how would the result look? That, so now we need to address this question. Let's say that it ends up looking like this.
which is to say like this arrow tip to that arrow tip. And what I'd, what I'd like for you to observe is that the, when, you, when you mapped the red arrow, it became bigger, at least the way I drew it. So G, G is what's saying that the tail of this arrow needs to go right there. That's what the function is saying. The tail of this arrow to there. <coughs> what is saying that not only does it need to move over there, but it's got to get bigger? So not, not, just, not just go over there, but be bigger when you get there. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Well, let the, the arrows are what they are. But the, the, the function g says, you go there. Which is to say, g of x, u is g of x. That's what's, that's what's causing the arrow to move position. What's causing the arrow to change size? I'm not sure what you mean by power. Which one? The derivative. The derivative is what's saying change size. So, so the way I drew it, I intended to draw it such that the green one was twice as big as the red one. What that means, what that means is that right there at that point, the derivative is two. Because objects, when you map them from here with that function, they get twice as big. If this arrow was 10 times as big, that would mean the derivative is 10. If it was half as big, that would mean the derivative is half. That's what it would mean. What would it mean if this arrow was just like it is, except pointed the other way, right? Because we could take the arrow and then twist it. What would that mean about the derivative? The derivative would be negative. So if this arrow, if the green one was five times as big as the red one but pointed in the opposite direction, then what would that mean about the derivative? It'd be negative five. That's what it would mean. That's what it means. So now, I'm going to call this red thing dx. And I'm going to call this green thing dy. And, w and we just answered the question, how much bigger is the, is the green thing than the red thing? Which is to say, dy is some multiple of, oh, sorry, that should be a u, du. du is some multiple of dx. What multiple? g prime of x, the derivative. Now, let's furthermore say that we, we did that for this leg of the journey. Now we need to do it for this leg of the journey. Let's suppose further that that green arrow becomes this blue arrow. <clears throat> so again, I made it a little bigger and I made it, my intention was to make it look about twice as big again or maybe one and a half times as big. So what, what tells this U, not the arrow, just, that, just the tail, what tells, th tells this U to become that Y? That U becomes that Y. Not the derivative. F does, right? You give F that U and it makes for you that Y. U go there. y is f of u. Now, that, that is like saying that the green arrow is moving down to be over there. But when you get there, I want you to be bigger. 
What's telling the green arrow to be bigger when you get there? The derivative is telling it to, to be bigger. Specifically, <clears throat> dy is some multiple of du. Right? The blue thing is some multiple of the green thing. What multiple? F prime where? F prime at u. Right? Not f prime at x. X is way over here. It's f prime at u. Now, that's looking at the two separate legs of the journey. What if we say, you know what? I don't really care how it was made. <laughs> All I want to know is what it looks like from the outside. <coughs> Let's cover it up. Which is to say, all I want to know is how, the, is how the, the red things become the blue things. Right? And this one is a dy. How does a dx become a dy? How does a red arrow become a blue arrow? Well, it does so in two steps. First it becomes a green arrow, and then it becomes a blue arrow. So, specifically, what we know is that the blue thing, dy, is f prime evaluated at u multiplied by the green thing. And furthermore, we know that the green thing, du, is g prime evaluated at x multiplied by what? The red one. Now look, the green thing appears in both equations. Is it possible to eliminate the green by substituting one into the other? Yeah. Let's do it. And let's make the equation only depend on red and blue, on dy and dx. Combining these, we get that dy is f prime evaluated at u. So that's that part. And then what do I write for the green? Mm -hmm. g prime of x dx. Now, here's, here's, there's two more steps to make. What is u now? Right, u is right there. What is u? u is g of x. So I can say that dy is f prime of g of x multiplied by g prime of x dx. And now rewrite this equation with the left hand side as dy dx. dy dx is what? f prime of g of x multiplied by g prime of x. And all that it is saying. That seems like some formula that just comes out of nowhere. Like, oh, here's another formula that the calculus instructor wants, wants me to remember. No. What it's, saying, what it's saying is that if you wiggle this red one, it's going to make the green one wiggle. And that's going to make the blue one wiggle. If you change the input x, it causes the, out, it causes the green one to wiggle like g prime of x, which in turn causes the blue one to wiggle like f prime of g of x times g prime of x. That's what it's saying. So you've seen the chain rule lots of times in, in real life. So since we're at university, it's likely that you've had to take at least a rudimentary 
biology course. So I'll assume that you have. Now, one of the things that you've got to do in a biology course is you've got to use the microscope. You've got to use the microscope at least once and visualize a, the difference between an animal cell and a plant cell or something. You know, you got to do it. So, <clears throat> that part of the microscope that you're actually like holding with your fingers and you're trying to get your eyes situated over it, what's the name for that part? It's called the eyepiece. It's a good name, right? It's called the eyepiece. Then, what you put the specimen on, that's called the stage. Okay, then immediately above the stage is that rotating <coughs> bit. What's the name of the rotating bit? Didn't think we were going to get into this, huh? <laughs> I was told there would be no biology. <laughs> the objective. It's called the objective. Right? So now, I want you to consider. An eyepiece typically has magnification 10. That's what it typically has. Not all of them, but typically, and we'll go with that. The objective usually has at least three lenses of various magnification. So let's suppose that we have the objective set to 40, and the eyepiece is 10. Then the magnification is 400. And how did you get that? Right. You multiply the individual magnifications. Okay, 40 times 10 is 400. That means that objects are 400 times as big, apparently. The, the apparent size of them is 400 times. Okay. And then if you do a different, may, maybe the same, but maybe, maybe a more advanced biology course, then you, then you get the, the, the eyepiece that actually there's one that is 10, and then there's an objective that's 100, but it actually doesn't, that, that one doesn't work right unless you actually use the oil. You know what I'm talking about? I gotta put the oil on it. It's real, he knows. So, <clears throat> so w the effective magnification in such a case is what? If it's 10 and 100. 1,000, right? Things are 1,000 times smaller. Now you're starting to see real small stuff. Okay. So, what I'm telling you is that you put your eye right here, and you're looking at it through the eyepiece, through the neck, onto the stage, and you've got a light source here. What I'm telling you is that you put a little bacterium or what, or what have you, on the stage there. <coughs> You've got it there. Then you turn on the light. The light emits a whole bunch of photons. Photons are all coming out through the stage. They pass through the specimen. Okay, some of them are blocked, creating shadows. Some of them are absorbed and then retransmitted, making the various colors of the specimen. Then they go through the photons travel through the objective. The objective, all that it's doing is it takes these photons, which are traveling more or less straight towards your eye, and it spreads them out. Many of the photons, as a result of this, don't make it to your eye. They end up impacting the sidewall. Then those that do make it, they pass through the objective, and they are even further spread out. This is the chain rule. That's what this is. When you're doing all the stuff on the microscope, it's the chain rule. First it's modified this much, then modified that much, and the total modification is the product, just like the chain rule. Okay, then you can get into further nice details, like for example, the actual image on your retina has to be focused, right? It's all, all the photons are all spread out because of these things, and then they go through your cornea, and then they have to converge back <laughs> together, and actually they over-converge, and the image on the back of your retina is actually upside down. <laughs> it's actually upside down, 
right? And then it's transmitted back to your visual <coughs> cortex where who knows what happens, right? Maybe it's turned back, back the other way, who knows? Interesting. So any questions about the chain rule? Okay. <clears throat> so now, let's switch gears to more computation-based thing. Um, so for example, I want you to solve two x minus five divided by x plus three is less or equal to one. And I want you to solve this using a sign chart. So, just by a quick show of hands, does anyone have any idea what I mean by sign chart? Not really. Okay, good. So we're all starting at the beginning. So, using a sign chart. So the way you construct a sign chart always starts with, the first, with this first step. You have to do something called computing the natural domain. The natural domain. Now, <clears throat> depending on your previous instructor, that might, we're maybe coming to a slight point of confusion. Okay, so what natural domain is, is this is the set of all x's Uh, such that such that the inequality <coughs> is defined. Now I'm going to underline defined. <coughs> because <coughs> Here's a few, uh, a few bits of terminology that high school instructors, not so much university instructors, but, but high school instructors very frequently do not get this part right. So I have a question. Five equal five. Is that an equation? It is. It's an equation because it has a left-hand side, and it has a right-hand side, and it has an equal in the middle. It's an equation. Okay. What does this equation evaluate to? It evaluates to? So equations can only evaluate to two things, true or false. So what, do, what does this equation evaluate to? True. Okay, now here's where sometimes it goes off the rails. How about four equal seven? Is this an equation? Yes, it is an equation. <coughs> Some of you are like, no, nah, it ain't. <laughs> no, <laughs> it is. It's an equation because it has a left-hand side and a right-hand side and an equal in between, it's an equation. The thing that you're objecting to, you're, you, what, the, thing, the thing that you're maybe in disagreement, you, you think you're in disagreement, is you're saying that that's not an equation because in fact four is not equal to seven. I, I have no objection, I agree. But here, here's the question that you wanna answer. What does this equation evaluate to? Okay, and then what's the usual name for that? False, right? So is this an equation? Yes. But it evaluates false. That doesn't mean that there's something immoral or unethical about it. It just means that its evaluation is false. Okay, it is an equation. Its evaluation is false. Okay, now. Um, how about 
8 greater or equal to uh, 5. Is that an inequality? Yes. What does it evaluate to? True. How about 1 greater or equal to 9? Is that an inequality? Yes. What does it evaluate to? False. OK. So are we squared away on the terminology? The distinction between whether the distinction between whether or not something is an equation and what it evaluates to. So there's a distinction that has to be made. So now, what I'm asking for in this question is tell me everywhere that the inequality is defined. Notably, I'm not asking for you to tell me everywhere that it's true. I just want to know everywhere that you can plug in something at all. What do you have against negative threes? Right. So have a look at this. Have a look at this inequality. You could plug in 10. There's nothing wrong with plugging in 10, right? It'd be 2 times 10 is 20 minus 5 is 15 divided by 10 plus 3, that's 13. So that'd be 15 divided by 13. And that is, in fact, less or equal to 1. So, so not only is it defined there, but it's also true there. Okay. Does everyone see that the, that the only place where this inequality has a problem of evaluation is it negative 3? Negative 3 is the only place where, you, where it simply can't be evaluated. OK. So anything but negative 3. So now, that aside, the next thing that you have to do to make a sign chart is you're going to 0 and simplify it. So specifically, I want to get one of the sides of the inequality to be 0. So the way that I'll do that <coughs> is I'll, <coughs> say, subtract 1 from both sides. So if I subtract 1 from both sides, then now it, it reads like that. One of the sides is 0. Now, I want to simplify the left-hand side as much as possible. <clears throat> In particular, I want to get a common denominator so that it's a single fraction. Okay, so then how can I go about getting it to be a single fraction? Well, I could do the cross-multiply thing, right? I could construe this as, I could, I could see this as being 1 over 1, and then do this times 1 minus this times 1, and then all over the product. So I could do it like that. So 2x minus 5, and then minus x plus 3 over, oh, is that what the problem is, is that my 1's look funny? Okay, let's fix that real quick. So this is the, ra the way I write a 1. Okay. It's, quite, it's quite common among mathematicians to write 1s in this way, but le less common a a among the normal population. The, the reason is because, the reason is because, let's consider this expression. What is the meaning of that expression that I just wrote? Really? Because I thought I heard someone else saying 1 minus 11. Ah, see, she said it. You, she said the one thing. You said the other thing. <laughs> you were right. <laughs> well, now let me ask you about this one. What does that mean? 1 minus 11. <laughs> right, this one can mean only one thing. Right? So ver vertical bars 
are used a great deal in mathematics, and, and so are ones for that matter. So mathematicians usually choose to make them look a little different. Okay. So as for this, is there any question how I got here? Is that minus one or multiplied by this? Minus one. Subtract one, right? So then I, on this inequality, I'm subtracting one from both sides, moving the one over. Okay, then less or equal to zero. Other questions how we got here. <clears throat> so now let's carry out the subtraction. So that would be what? Um, 2x minus x, so that'd be a single x. And then negative 5 minus 3, so that'd be minus 8. Any question getting to there? <clears throat> this is okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, the third step. So this, this wasn't assigned up here. <coughs> the third step is that we're going to solve the corresponding equation. So at the end of this step, we have an inequality. So now I'm going to convert this inequality to the corresponding equation. That is to say, I'm going to write x minus 8 divided by x plus 3. But instead of writing the inequality, I'm going to write equal 0. Now, solving an equation is a much simpler task than solving an inequality. So how do you solve this equation? Multiply what? Very good. So if you do that, then it reads like x minus 8 is 0 multiplied by x plus 3, which is nice, right? Because that just, that just goes away. So then x minus 8 is uh, 0, so x is 8. So that's, that's the only solution to the equation. So any question about this? Four. Now, this method is named after this step. So this step is called the sign chart. So specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to draw the number line. And in the course of the exercise to now, we've collected two points. We collected this point. and this point. And we're going to plot them. We're going to mark them on this <coughs> number line. And they're going to be marked as fence posts. Okay, so someone tell me what I've done wrong here. Okay, well that, that's not the order they go in, right? <laughs> so so I'm just I'm just saying that I see this all the time. Having graded hundreds and thousands of these. Okay, so negative three and 8. So to now, what we've done, the, all the work to now, has been to carve up the reals into these three regions. The stuff that's to the left of negative 3, the stuff between negative 3 and 8, and the stuff to the right of 8. We've carved it into those three regions. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample point from each region. So can you tell me something to the left of negative 3? Okay, how about <coughs> negative 4? And 
How about to the left of 8, but to the right of negative 3? Yeah. 0, okay. And to the right of 8? 9. Okay. Now, what are we going to do with those three sample points? Not the original. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to plug it into that one, right? So we're going to take those values, and we're going to take them back over to here and plug them into here. Okay. But we're not interested in the actual value. We're just interested in the sign of the result. So specifically, we'll, we'll plug them into numerator and denominator. So negative 4. If you plug negative 4 into the numerator, what sign do you get? Negative. So this will be negative over. And then if you plug negative 4 into the denominator, what sign do you get? Negative. OK. Fine. Now let's plug in 0. If you plug 0 into the, into the numerator, what do you get? Negative. And the denominator? Positive. And then uh, 9, you get positive over positive. Is there any question why that's the pattern of signs that you get? <coughs> OK. Now. From that pattern of signs, you can get the overall sign. So what's the overall sign of the expression in this region, seeing as it's negative over negative? It's positive, right? Because the quotient of two negatives is positive. Similarly, in the middle, negative, and in the right, positive. So I have a question. Why do you suppose this step is called the sign chart? Because <laughs> it's a chart full of signs. <laughs> Mathematicians don't come up with very exciting names. Okay. <laughs> Chain rule, yeah. Well, besides that one, I guess. <laughs> okay. So now, we took the reels, we carved it into three pieces, we labeled each piece as being positive or being negative. We're now in a position to make a conclusion. The answer to the question is either all of the negative regions or all of the positive regions. We want all of, of exactly one kind. What kind do we want? The positive ones? <coughs> Why? Because we're positive people? or? You, someone else thinks negative? Does someone else think negative? Which ones do we want? Yeah? You, you think negative? Do you have a reason why you want negative? Just, just, okay. Yeah? Right. Look at this. We want to know when this is less or equal to zero. Which regions do we want? The negative ones. We want the negative ones. Now, do understand that if I was to go back in time and change this exercise to where it says, to where it's the other way, blah, blah, greater or equal to 1, then it would be flipped everywhere, including here, and we wouldn't be interested in the negative regions. We'd be interested in the positive ones. The, the, the answer to the question, which regions do we want, in the end, exactly and only depends on this, whatever this is. So what's the answer then? in interval notation. Not negative infinity. Negative 3 to 8. Right? But then there's a further question. 
Because there's four intervals which go from negative 3 to 8, depending on whether or not you include negative 3 and whether or not you include negative 8. So how about, uh, sorry, positive 8. Uh, are we supposed to include 8? Yes. Why? <coughs> Right. So if you plug in 8 into here, then it's 0 over 11, which is, less, which is 0, which is less or equal to 0. So we should include 8 because it says less or equal. Should we include negative 3? Why not? I thought less or equal. Right. Negative 3 is not even part of the natural domain. It surely can't be part of the solution. Look what would happen if you tried to plug in negative 3. It's not even defined there. That's the answer. Okay, now, this whole thing is the answer, right? The whole making a sign chart, the process is the answer. Now, this, this question is usually, this kind of question is, is not usually asked in calculus. Rather, something extremely similar to this is asked in calculus. What is this just like that you surely did in calculus? You don't make sign charts in calculus, typically. You make what? Slope charts. Concavity charts. What is a slope chart? It's a sign chart of the derivative. That's all that it is. You, you take a function, you compute its derivative, you make a sign chart. Why should that be interesting? Task to do. Well, remember that derivative represents change. And if the derivative is positive at a point, what does that mean about the measurement in question? It's increasing there. If it's negative at a point, what does that mean about the measurement there? It's decreasing. If you make a sign chart and you observe a place where the derivative is first positive and then negative, that means that the function was first increasing and then decreasing. That's a notable circumstance. That's a relative maximum. First increase, then decrease. And then if you turn that around, it's a relative minimum. First decrease, then increase. That's a notable thing. That's why okay, you, it's such a common task in calculus to, to do that. So let's do that. <clears throat> Find and classify. all relative extrema using, uh, how does your book? Yeah, we'll write it like that. Using a slope chart. And uh, what your book says, your book probably doesn't say using a slope chart. It probably says using the first derivative test or something like this. And the function we're going to do this with is <coughs> 2x cubed. minus 3x squared minus 72x plus 1326. And we want to find the relative extrema. Okay? You, it, by making a slope chart. What's the first step in making a slope chart?
Not quite. What is it? Domain. That's always the first step. It's always the first step. So, as for that function, what is its natural domain? All x. All rims. Which is to say, how many breaks, how many breaks are there in the natural domain? None. Well, that's nice. What that means is that we just didn't get any fence posts from that category. <coughs> but you could get as, I, I could arrange a question where you get as many as you desire, right? Seven, I could make it. Okay, the next step is to find the critical points. Critical points. Okay, so there's two varieties of critical point. First off, yeah, so, so someone please tell us, what is a critical point? Not quite, almost something like that. Not x either, now we're getting further away. It's not when the function is zero. When what? when the derivative is zero, the derivative of the function. But there's another way in which you can be at a critical point besides the derivative being zero. What's the other way? The derivative, it, it doesn't exist, yeah. The derivative is not defined. Meaning that the tangent is horizontal or there isn't one, there isn't a tangent. So for example, in your mind's eye, what does <coughs> absolute value look like? It's plot. A V, right? And it's pointy at the bottom, like the square end of a sharp table, right? Is there a tangent at the bottom of absolute value? Is there a, is there a tangent line? There isn't, right? Because it's pointy there. You can only have a tangent line at a smooth spot. How about, how about at a, the bottom of a parabola? Is there a... Is there a tangent line at the bottom of a parabola? Yeah, that's smooth, right? It's smooth. You could rub your finger on it and not injure yourself. Absolute value is sharp. If you were to do it, it would, it would cut you like a razor. It's sharp. So what are the two varieties of critical point where the derivative is 0 or, or undefined? Good. So in order to find the critical points, we need the derivative. What is the derivative of this function? Six x squared. What else? Minus six x minus seventy two. And then, alas, we lost our thirteen twenty six. Oh well. So now we need to factor this. So in the first place, I can see that sixes are common, so I'll factor them out. So the derivative, I can factor out of six, and then if I do that, that'd be x squared minus x, and then there's 12 of them, so, tw so minus 12. And then does that factor? Yeah. So how does that quadratic factor? Very good. Okay, any question about getting to there? So then now, as for the two varieties of critical point. Oh, come on. I'm so sorry. Uh, where is the derivative undefined? I disagree. You're getting ahead of yourself. Where is it undefined? Uh, 
It's always defined. There's nothing you couldn't plug in. <coughs> right? So then, uh, by, by way of, by way of counterexample, if the derivative, if it had so happened that this was the derivative, then where would the derivative be undefined? At negative three. Okay. But where is this undefined? Nowhere. So there's, there's none here. Now, I'll ask the question that everyone was jumping to answer. Where is the derivative equal to zero? Negative three and positive four. Okay. So your, your, uh, your calculus one instructor, did, did they distinguish between, did they give different names to these? The places where, the, where there is no tangent, the places where there is a horizontal one. <coughs> They give different names. They just said derivative is zero, the derivative is undefined. Okay, we'll say that. Other, play, other contexts, sometimes, often, at least when I teach calculus one, I call these, these are called stationary points, and these ones um, non-smooth. But it doesn't matter. So in this exercise, there have been three, three slots, three boxes, where we could have accumulated points. We could have accumulated points there, but as it happened, we didn't accumulate any. We could have accumulated points here, but as it happened, we didn't accumulate any. And we could have accumulated points here, and as it happened, we accumulated two. So these points, I could, for any number, you give me any three non-negative integers and say, I want, I want there to be seven in here, I want there to be three in here, and I want there to be 48 in here. I, I could do it. I would never, <laughs> I would never do it. Right? There'd be entirely too many points in an exercise. But if you wanted like one, one, and one, I could do it. Okay, so don't, don't expect that some or all of these are going to be empty. These, these two happen to be empty because I wanted a, a relatively easy exercise. Okay. <clears throat> so now that we've done that, now we make the slope chart. Specifically, now we plot the number line and how many fence posts do we need to make? Two, right? Because there were none from this category, none from this category, two from this category. If it had been two, two, and two, we'd have to make six fence posts. Okay, I'll, I'll, never, I'll never do an exercise that has so many regions because it would be impossible to grade. So negative three and four, right? These come from... there and there. <clears throat> now what do we do? Right, sample some points. So how about um, negative 4, 0, and 5? Okay, you could have chosen different points. These ones will work fine. What do we do with those? Plug them into what? The derivative. But wait a minute, why are, we not, why are we not plugging them into the original function, though? Why the derivative? What kind of thing are we making right now? We're making a slope chart. So we've got to be evaluating the thing that tells us about <coughs> slope, right? The derivative. If we were, what would we, what would we be making if we were plugging into the, if we needed to be plugging into the original function? What would we be making? Not a slope chart. 
a sign chart. We'd be making a sign chart. What if we were plugging into the second derivative? What would we be making? What is it? I can't hear you. A line chart? I don't know that one. So I'm fishing for something that starts with C. Concavity. If we were using, the, if we were doing this procedure with the second derivative, we'd be making a concavity chart. We're making a slope chart. That's why we have to use the first derivative. That's why. <coughs> That's why we plug in there. Now, what if we, <laughs> here's a fun one. What if we were using the third derivative? What is the name of the sign chart of the third derivative of a function? Right, you've got a sign chart, a slope chart, a concavity chart. What's the next one? Believe, <laughs> believe it or not, it's called a jerk chart. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> it really is. It really is because in physics, in physics, the first derivative is velocity, the second derivative is acceleration, and the third derivative is jerk. It really is. So, so that's why we have to plug into the first derivative. Okay. So this is going to be plugged into here. Okay. So let's do that. If we plug in negative 4, well, that 6 is positive, so I'm just going to write positive for that 6. And then if I plug negative 4 into that, that'll be negative. If I plug negative 4 into that, what it'll be? Not 0. Negative 8, which is negative. Okay, if I plug 0 into those things, well, 6 is positive, so I'll just write positive. And if I plug 0 in there, I get something positive and then something negative. Uh, 5, that would be positive, and then positive, and then positive. Okay, so now, about 10 minutes ago, or whatever, we were saying, what is the overall sign and then we wrote the overall <coughs> sign when we were making a sign chart. So, now, we're still doing that, more or less. And I'll ask, what is the overall sign in this region? Positive. But I'm not going to write a big positive symbol. Rather, I'm going to write the symbol that means positive slope. Because it's a slope chart. What is the positive slope symbol? This one. Positive slope symbol. Okay. What is the overall sign in this region? Negative. So that means we write the negative slope symbol. And then positive. You should also be aware that um, though it has happened in, in lectures so far that the signs alternate positive, negative, positive, that need not be the case. You can give me any <coughs> sequence of the words negative and positive of any length, and I can give you an exercise where the sign chart is, is that. Right? You could say, oh, I want you to make me one that's negative, negative, negative 47 times and then positive. No problem. We could do it. Okay. Any question about getting to here? Now, what bearing does this have on the actual question that was that was to be answered? Right. The, the underlying question, because this exercise gave you gave you a goal and also the method you were supposed to take to get to that goal. The goal was to find and classify all relative extrema. That's the goal. And then you're supposed to do it using a sign chart. Well, you've made the sign chart. Uh, thank you, slope chart. Using a slope chart. You've made the slope chart. How does the slope chart bear upon the question? 
of relative extrema. Okay. In what way? Right. So notice, even the, even the chart itself is visually suggestive. Right? Up and then down. Here is probably a relative max. So is it in fact a relative max? So is it or is it not? <coughs> so if it, it, it is, okay? So, so we can make our conclusions. Conclusions. So x equal to negative three is a relative max. Now you might think, you might be wondering what I meant by is it really a relative max or is it not? Can you think of an example where the sign chart would look like this, the slope chart would look like this, yet it wouldn't be a relative max? Think about that for a minute and we'll come back to that. Something that looks like this but yet it's not a relative max. Okay, how about uh, this point, what's this? Relative min. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the answer to the question, okay. to, to this exercise. <coughs> Any question about this exercise? Now let's consider what is it that I meant when I said, well, just because the slope chart looks like that, that doesn't mean it's an extremum. It doesn't mean that. So specifically, I would like for you to remember the shapes of two functions. This one is called the reciprocal function. How do you draw it? How is it drawn? Very good. So let's think about it for a minute. What, what happens to this? So in the first place, if we're on the right side, so if I ignore the left side, if we're on the right side, then x is positive and 1 over x is positive. Which means that if we're on the right side, we must be on the top side. Because being on the right side means the input is positive. Being on the top side means that the output is positive. So when x gets big, 1 over x has to get small in the same way that if you had a pizza, say, and you cut it into eight slices, <coughs> then everyone would get a reasonable slice. Right? If there were eight people, eight even slices, everyone gets a pretty reasonable slice. But if you take a pizza and you cut it into 800 slices, well, you don't get very much, do you? Okay? As x gets big, 1 over x gets small. Still positive. How about what happens when x gets small and is still positive? What happens to 1 over x? It gets big. Because, for example, here's a, here's a small-ish number, 0 0.10. What's 1 divided by 0 0.10? It's 10, right? In the same sense that how many dimes are in a dollar? 10, right? What's 1 divided by one one hundredth. A hundred. In the same way that how many pennies are there in a dollar? A hundred, right? 
So you take any really big number that you can imagine, like 1326. What's 1 divided by 1 over 1326? 1326, right? And that works, obviously, with any number that you write, that you'd like. Billion, 1 divided by 1 1 billionth is a billion. So, so the right side of this plot looks like this. As you go to the right, you go to zero. As you go to zero, you go to infinity. What does the left side of the plot look like? Okay. The opposite, both reflected that way and the other way. And it's kind of a nice visual illustration of why division by zero is not defined. Because this is, this is in a sense, the function that tries to divide by anything, right? You give it, a, you give it a, any x, it says, well, I'm going to do 1 over x. You give it a 2, it says, I'm going to do 1 over 2. And you can imagine, what, what would happen if you started giving this function, this machine, values of x that were increasingly close to 0? Then, then its outputs, if you were giving it positive values, its outputs would start to become positive, would start to get positively infinite without bound. Whereas if you were giving it negative values, it would be going this way, right? You can just, if, it's not real good to personify machines or functions, but you can just imagine, like, you know, you're giving it values and it's saying, no, 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 right? <laughs> you know, going to explode if you give me that zero. Okay, how does this one look? Not quite. It's not like that. If, if it was, if it was, if it was negative x squared, it would be an upside down parabola. But this is one divided by x squared. It'll be quite. It'll be in many ways similar to this one. Well, let's think about it for a minute. Why is this? Why is this piece on the bottom half? of the axis, this piece. Right, because on this, on this side, you're plugging in negative x's. And then 1 over x is negative, when x is negative. So it's on the bottom half. When will this be negative? Never, right? Because, the, because if you plug, plug in positive x's, well, it's going to be positive. If you plug in negative x's, you're going to square it. That's going to be positive, and then 1 over x, that's positive. So that means all of, the, all of this should be on the top, half. And that's more or less what it is. It's just like this one, but putting all the stuff on the top. It looks like this. More or less. Now, what is the natural domain of this function? And? Very good. And that is also the natural domain of this function. Now, for that piece of that function, is it increasing or decreasing? It's decreasing, right? As you go to the right, you go down on this part of the function. So its slope symbol is this in that region. What about that part? Also decreasing. Decreasing and then decreasing some more. Okay. What about this one? Increasing. What about this one? Decreasing. And here's the rub. 
If you were to look at this slope chart, does it have a relative max? No. Well, it it, 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 that's a, it makes it seem like that could be a candidate. But does the actual function have a relative max? It does not. It doesn't. That's the difference between a necessary and a sufficient condition, is that to be a relative max, it, supposing the function is differentiable everywhere except possibly there, it's necessary for it to look like this, but it's not sufficient. In the same sense that um, it is a fact that when it's nighttime on the part of Earth that you're on, you, you cannot, you don't have line of sight to the sun. That's what it means to be nighttime. However, if you don't have, if you can't see the sun, does that mean it's nighttime? No, right? Your eyes might be closed. <laughs> there's, there's all, there's all number, manner of reasons why you couldn't see the sun. Right? So then it's, it's, it's a necessary condition to not be able to see the sun for it to be nighttime. But it's not sufficient. So another way to say it would be like, would be like me saying, here I have a red apple. <laughs> to which you might respond, I'm not really sure you have that right. And then I say, it's clearly red. Well, but what do I have wrong? <laughs> it's, not, it's not an apple in the first place. right? How about this point right here? Is that point a relative extremum? No, for a very simple reason. It's not even there. It's not even a point. Of course it's not a relative extremum. Because it's not even a point in the first place. Good. Any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> now, um, what about the second derivative? So what I mean uh, is the following. I'm going to point out this sort of funny business in the language. So suppose we have a function And then I say, OK, here's a point. I want you to draw the tangent line at that point. And then it's my hope that you would draw something more or less like this. OK. <clears throat> now, here's the thing about lines, is lines can be broken into two categories. They're either vertical or they're not. If they're vertical, that means you can take two different points and they're right on top of each other. Otherwise, if you take two different points, they're not right on top of each other. So suppose that we have a non-vertical line and we have two different points. Then you can measure the horizontal distance between them and the vertical distance between them and compute the ratio. And what is the name for that? Slope. And what's notable about that is you can take any two different points, any two, on the same line, any two different points, and the slope will always be the same. It doesn't matter if they're very close or very far away. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they're within the width of a hydrogen atom of each other. It doesn't matter if they are, if they are the, the diameter of the Milky Way galaxy away from each other. It doesn't matter. You compute rise over run, you get slope. 
So lines have slope. It's, it's something that lines just have. Now this red is a, is a wavy, curvy function. So it's not a line. It's not a line. But yet, in a slight abuse of language, you say that it has a slope. But, what, but what's really happening is that, is that this function doesn't have, doesn't have slope. What it really has is it has a tangent line. It has a tangent line, and that tangent line has slope. And so rather than saying the slope of the tangent line of this function is 5 or whatever, you usually just elide all of that language and say the slope of the function at that point is 5, which is just an abuse of terminology to say that the slope of the tangent line of that function is 5. So in that way, you're kind of saying, oh, OK, well, well, we'll assign the property of slope to, to the function because it has a tangent line. And it's a, it's a completely, in, in that way, the first derivative is sort of a completely um, intelligible thing. If I tell you that here's a function, and at that point, it has, uh, it has slope negative 3, then in my mind, I can imagine a line that has slope negative 3, and I know what that looks like. That means that every time you move to the right one <coughs> unit, you go down three units. That's what it means. Now, I have a different question for you. Suppose that I say, what, what is the name of the measure that, that the second derivative gives you? So first derivative gives you slope. What's the name for the second derivative? Concavity. Well, the first derivative is telling you what the tangent line looks like. What is the second derivative telling you? But what does that even mean? What does concave mean? It's, it's kind of, there's something to think about there, right? So on the one hand, I hope that by the, since you've taken calculus, you know more or less that concave up, uh, you know, kind of bows, bows upward like this. And then concave down is the other way. Uh, and I, I furthermore hope that um, you know you would know the difference visually between say concavity five and concavity ten. What's the difference? Right? Or the concavity of negative two and negative ten. Well, this line. <clears throat> if this is the line. Why is mx plus b? Since every line can be written as y is mx plus b. What is the first derivative telling you? The first derivative is picking out m. It's telling you that number. That's what the first derivative tells you. Now, in case it wasn't clear from calculus one, I'm going to tell you what, what number the second derivative is telling you. So now, at that point, instead of attaching the tangent line, what the, t what the tangent line is, it is, it, is the best, it is the line that best fits that function at that point. You can't get a better line than that tangent line. But now I have a separate request. Now I want you to get the best parabola that could possibly fit that function at that point. The, the parabola that agrees with that function the most. Okay? And it is called the tangent parabola. 
And just eyeballing it, it looks approximately like this. Tangent parabola. It agrees in, in the sense that the, that the tangent line agrees with the function. The tangent parabola agrees even better. Even better. Now, every parabola, every parabola can be written as y is, uh, let's say it like this, y is ax squared plus bx plus c. And furthermore, we know that every parabola that has a non-zero non leading coefficient either looks like this, the kind that opens down, or like this, the kind that opens up. All parabolas look like that. Yeah? We're going to get to that, and the answer is yes, Unle unless the exercise says using a slope chart, <laughs> right? So, so what does so ignoring everything else except for that y is ax squared plus bx plus c, what must be true about this, about a, b, and c for this? for it to look like this? A is negative. <coughs> right? And negative people, are they smiling or frowning? Frowning, right? It even looks like a frowny face, doesn't it? Yeah, a little nose there. So then here, this is when A is positive. Okay, and that even looks like a smiley face, right? Smile Positive people are smiling. Well, what is the second derivative doing? Numerically. Finding A. That's what it's doing. That's why. That's the reason why positive concavity looks like this. Because parabolas with positive leading coefficients look like this. That's why. That's why negative concavity look, uh, looks like this. It's because parabolas with negative leading coefficients look like this. That's why. Now, the, the neat thing, if you decide to go on and take a whole bunch of math courses, right? A guy can dream, right? <laughs> you could have tangent lines tangent parabolas, tangent whatever you want. Okay, one of the big things in, 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 in physics that you have to study is you end up studying something called tangent circles. You just want the circle that best fits. Okay, so you can have tangent lines, tangent parabolas, tangent circles, tangent bananas, whatever, whatever it is okay, that, that best befits your problem. Okay. So that's what the second derivative is measuring. Now, <clears throat> just like we were interested, just like we were interested in when the first derivative changes sign, we're interested in where the first derivative changes sign because that means that the function goes from increasing to decreasing or vice versa. And supposing that point is actually defined, then that's a good candidate for a relative extremum. Now, the places where the second derivative changes sign, so that it changes from concave up to down or vice versa, those are also notable points. What are they called? Where the concavity changes from up to down or down to up. That, that, that's, all, that's a half truth. That's kind of right. But there's a specific name. It's an I word. Not intercept. Inflection. A point of inflection. Right? Inflection. Points of inflection are where the <coughs> concavity changes. Okay. 
So now, <clears throat> many students go through, it, 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 at any rate, it's possible to go through calculus and know how to compute a point of inflection and to know, oh, that's where the second derivative changes sign. But you can kind of sometimes on accident make it through a calculus course and not understand what that means. So, so here's, here's an interesting thing, is that I, I pretty much guarantee that every one of you have w went through several points of inflection on your trip here. Okay? In your, mind's, in your mind's eye, I'd like to you to imagine that you were driving your vehicle to get here. Was there at any point a time when the steering wheel was a little bit to the left so that you would make a left turn? Probably, right? <laughs> That'd be incredible if you made it here without doing that. <coughs> okay, and then was there also a place where the, where the steering wheel was a little bit to the right? Then you went through at least one point of inflection getting here. Now, in your mind's eye, imagine that you're traveling and you're doing a bit of an S curve so that you're traveling, so that your steering wheel is a little bit to the right for part of the S curve, and then it's a little bit to the left for, part of the, for, the, for the other part of the S curve. Then necessarily, because you didn't teleport, there must have been a time when your steering wheel was straight up and down. That is the point of inflection. That point is the point of inflection. Which is to say, Then if you were driving along this trajectory and you were driving in the, in the direction indicated by the arrow, if you were right here and driving that way, driving that way, then how would the steering wheel be if you were here? It would be to the right. The steering wheel would be to the right. And if you were here, how would the steering wheel be? to the left. So there must be a case where the steering wheel was exactly straight ahead. Where is it? Yeah, just eyeballing it, I'd say about right there. That's the point of inflection. That's the point of inflection. And then, just to help you see which one is which, so that means that, that the concavity changes across, if, if we're <coughs> plotting this that way. Uh, so what's the, what is the sign of the concavity over here? Negative. And then over here? Positive. In, in case you're not real comfortable with that, so at least the way I think about it is I look at that and say, oh, this is the way parabolas with negative leading coefficients look. But just as good a way as to write some little googly eyes over it and say, oh, it looks like a frowny face. Okay, and then negative, negative people are frowning. Okay, and then you can do the same thing over here. Look at that big smirk. Positive people are smiling. Negative concavity, positive concavity. Okay, but again, a switch in concavity does not mean a point of inflection because the point in question might not even be a point. What is the concavity here? Right here. It's down. What's the concavity here? Up. So the concavity appears to change down to up. Is that a point of inflection? No. It isn't, because it's not even a point. It's not even a point, but even worse. There's a nice function. You can see that something strange happens there in the middle. So how about right there? Is it concave down or up? Down. 
And how about here? Up. And now there is a point. Is that a point of inflection? No, it isn't. Because that's the other necessary condition to be a point of inflection, is that to be a point of inflection, you need a tangent line. Is there a tangent there? There is not. It's pointy there. No tangent, no point of inflection. If you like, can you imagine driving this trajectory with your car, <laughs> right? That's, you know, that's hitting a wall or whatever, right? That's not a point of inflection. That's, that's the point of impact or something, right? Not a point of inflection. You have to have a tangent. Okay. <clears throat> so, as you were saying, is that just like we have the first derivative test, which is sort of a misleading name, I think, for making a slope chart. We have the second derivative test. So we have these cases. So, three cases. Now, what, um, what does it look like where the derivative is zero? What does that mean, derivative is zero? So in the first place, what is the geometric interpretation of the derivative? Slope of tangent line. So, so what does a line of slope zero look like? Horizontal line. So, does this have any horizontal tangent lines? Yeah, at the top there, right? Does this one have any horizontal tangent lines? Yes, at the bottom. Does this one? It does. In the middle. So all of these, if that's the point C, they all have the condition that the derivative at C is 0. But now, <clears throat> what about the second derivative here? So ignore the green and just look at the red. What kind of concavity is here? Negative concavity. And what kind of concavity is here? Positive concavity. And what kind of concavity is here? Zero. So, in this case, in this case, where you have a horizontal tangent line with negative concavity, this is a relative max every time. So, if you find if you have found a place of horizontal tangency, then you can check if it is a relative max by just checking if the second derivative is negative. Similarly, what's this one? Relative min. So in these two cases, you can make a conclusion. If the second derivative happens to be negative or positive, you can make a conclusion. But if the second derivative is 0, you can't make a conclusion. Now, understand what that means. That doesn't mean that there is not a relative max. That doesn't mean that there is not a relative min. It means that you don't have enough information to make a conclusion. That's what it means. Okay, so this is the 
second derivative test. Probably better to call it the concavity test. Something like that. OK, well, I think that's all the time we have. So have a nice weekend. There's a, there's a online homework due Monday night, and there's a number of written homeworks due Tuesday. <laughs>